three photographers from three different time zones, all connected by night photography and all shooting with the Pentax K1. We are the Night Taxians. This lens I got because I, for whatever the reason, in the last year or so, I've gotten a huge uptick in people asking for uh, nighttime engagement portraits. Um, I had six or seven requests last year, which is um, six or seven more than I've ever had any other year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that has to do with the pandemic or what, but yeah, I, I had a huge amount of people because, you know, I do the tours and then people would find me through uh, Airbnb. I think they're looking for a photographer and they thought, well, this guy might be able to do it. And then I'm like, well, I only do the night stuff. And they say, oh, that's fine because there's lighthouses and everything else. But I really didn't have a lens that I turned a couple of people down because I didn't feel like I had the right lens for it. Um, sure. Yeah. But then I came across the Sam Yang here, which I paid, I got it on B B and H for two forty nine. I looked before we got on tonight. It's the same price still. Um, wow. Yeah. 85 millimeter F 1.4. Oh gosh. Wow. That's pretty nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm not unhappy yeah. with it. I mean, this is, uh, we've all owned Roken on lenses. We all own Roken on lenses. Uh, it's the same build quality. This one's just a little bit heavier than the fisheye. Sure, because, of Because, um, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit bigger. It does have a removable uh, shade, which is okay. nice. Um, I usually leave my shade on just because, especially if I'm around a, a lit environment, like there's a lighthouse nearby or some side lighting for cars or whatnot. You may not run into that where you guys are so much, but I do. So I, I'll leave that on. And plus, if you have a drop, and this is on there. Usually, that's going to stop the maybe that'll the help. damage, as yeah. I've learned in the past. <laughs> right, as you've learned. Yes, yeah. I, have. I think we all yeah. have. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Sad, sadly enough, um, it's kind of the rite of passage. It's just it happens to everybody sooner or later. It's just how long will it take before it happens to you? Yeah, and that's a plug. Yeah, we could probably actually, mm. we could probably actually have an episode just to <laughs> deal with <laughs> dropped out. equipment. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, we could. Oh yeah. We could. I yeah, will could. I will say uh let me throw this plug in real quick for anybody out there who does this as a business. If you don't have photography insurance, photographers insurance and you're doing anything that involves getting income through your photography, I highly 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 recommend it. Um I have to get the permits to do workshops on the national seashore and I have to get the insurance accord for the national parks. I have to list them as a, uh, AE just in case somebody, uh, trips on a lighthouse or falls down a cliff into the sand or we lose someone to the ocean tide, you know, whatever. Um, I, by the way, I have zero fatality rates. Currently, I'm at zero fatality. Uh, so I'm really happy. You better knock on wood right really now. Really happy about that. And there's yeah, your ringing there endorsement you right there. Yeah. All right. Timothy I tell people Little, that. Timothy Little, Cape Cod photographer, zero fatalities. Zero fatalities. Yeah. So um, that said, I, I need the insurance. But w one thing that it did help with is is the gear. Because when I dropped the 15 to 30, uh, I was able to get it repaired with a deductible, of course. But I was able to get it repaired and get a body swapped out. So. Just throwing nice. that out there. Consider it. Right. I pay, I think I pay $34 a month to have it. And that gives me the ability to get insurance for permits and also have the gear covered and just the usual damage stuff. You know, if you go out on someone's property and you mess something up, you'll have some coverage there too. Right, that's my soapbox, but it's, it's helpful. Mike, you, uh, or Ken, you have, you've had photographer's insurance before, haven't you? I do. I've, I've had it, um, I don't know, for several years now, at least five years, I think. Yeah. Probably Cause more. I think homeowners insurance will only cover your gear if you're not using it for commercial use. No. So mine's a separate rider for that. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So that's why I always leave the shades on, on these things, but I figured, yeah, I'll pick it up and for two forty nine, I'll have it and maybe I'll do some astro work with it, which mm. is what I did when I went out to, uh, Edgartown in, 
It was last year. It was September. A little late in the season, but that's the only thing I had time for. And it was my first night out with it for Astro work. So I shot Edgar Town Lighthouse, which I sent you guys. And um, I was really happy with it. it. There were a couple of things I didn't love about it. 85 millimeters is pretty tight. So when you're used to shooting 15 to 30 and then you pop one of these on there, you're really looking at getting pretty far back. Sure. That's a long sure that lens. Gonna... Yeah. yeah. That's a long yeah. lens for a typical night photographer. It is. It is. And so the locations that I was thinking about, this one in particular, I knew I'd be able to pull it off, but I was also really excited about the uh, F1.4 just to see how that was going to go. Because I don't have any lenses that stop down, that stop to 1.4. Right. And like you mentioned earlier, it's fun to just push the limits on <laughs> how how much can we get out of this thing? So I did shoot with 1.4, but for the this shot, I did 2.8 okay. because like any other lens out there, I think. Makes sense. Yeah. 1.4 with Astro landscape stuff like this does give you some soft corners. Yeah. You're probably going to get. As you would expect. Yeah. UFOs yeah. in the corners. You would. Oh, I, <clears throat> let me back up. I did. I shot this at F2, not one, uh, not 2.8. And I was still able to get that. But <laughs> UFOs in the corner. Yeah. 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 Pancakey stars. Yeah. But not, not on this one. So I was really happy with it it's pretty sharp and it also um has a really decent vignetting control okay which you can yeah, fix later nice. yeah i didn't really have to do much work on that side of it um i used the, this one's with astro trace okay I, so it, yeah uh, i thought as much yeah because that you've really got the stars nailed there so mm -hmm. yeah astro tracer to the rescue yeah yeah, Astro Tracer to the rescue for sure. I will say this: if I if I had one complaint mm. on the lens, it, it, the, the contrast on it is not fantastic. You know, um, I did some portrait work for someone. I'm not going to put the photos up just because I don't have their permission, but uh, it it looked really nice outdoors on a on a bright day. Uh, with not nice colors, but at night things just looked a little bit more washed. And I was shooting in an area that had a little bit of light pollution too, so right, I was working, that. working against that. But I was really thrilled with it, and it's a pretty limited use lens because it's eighty five. Um, on the Cape here, there's fairly limited areas that you can go to and get far enough back to be able to really utilize that focal use length. Mm. So yeah. I have a question. Yeah. You had you had mentioned that you got the eighty five millimeter because um, you were being asked to do portraits, night portraits, right? Yes. Yeah. So, out of curiosity, why would you choose the eighty five millimeter over the twenty eight to one hundred five? I'm just curious. Ah, yes. Okay, this is a good question, and now I'm thinking about your night portraits, right? That you had done recently. Okay, so. I could have used the 28 to 105, but what I was going for was not so much the background landscapey stuff. Okay. Um, it wasn't that big of a concern in my mind about the location as it was just the really nice bokeh. Mm. I wanted something pretty fast. Got it. Um, these people, so. The, the portraits that you did, and if, if you don't mind, I'd like to throw those on this video just as a reference point. Absolutely, yeah. The portraits that you did, which are fantastic, were, I think, designed to, it was an album cover, right? Or a, for a band. Yeah, it was for a band for album covers and promotional material yeah. and things like that. And they wanted some, they wanted something unique, something a little weird, mm -hmm. which you could pull off with that lens. And you know, utilize uh, maybe a tighter aperture and do a little bit of light painting and all that, where I was going for more of, in, in my mind, more of a traditional portrait. We're kind of ah. close up. We're maybe, you know, chest up this way here and um, nice soft backdrop with some twinkly lights. That's what I yeah, was That makes going sense. For. And when you, when you uh, were talking about the bouquet, that just made total sense because if you're getting F1.4, you're, you're probably getting some pretty sweet bouquet with that. Yes. And when you're, um, how do I put this? 
when you're dealing with people who are not necessarily used to being photography subjects and they're mm. also not going to be heavily involved in understanding what you need to do in order to make the picture happen because we live in a very sort of iPhone world where it's click and you're done. Um, trying to explain to somebody, you've got to stand still, long exposure, all this other stuff, and, and then try to get the effect that they're looking for is kind of tough. So I thought if I could get down to like F2 at least and get something that's relatively fast and right. maybe bring my ISO up just a tad, then I could create something with them without them having to do all that much or understand what I needed to do. Because at night you've got that whole extra level of, you know, logistics. So right. To speak. Right. Right. Yeah. That was my thought. And, you know, it's especially if you're kind of doing the, the run and gun thing, it sounds like you, when you did your night portraits, you had the opportunity to go out and explore a spot and tell them what was going on and spend some time in there. Where in my case, it was like, we're going to be at this lighthouse for this amount of time. Mm. Mm. And people are coming and going and, you know, there's all this activity and we have these little brief windows. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the night portraits that I did were quite relaxed and we had mm -hmm. the whole place to ourselves. And it was largely, you know, I mean, they're almost like landscapes with, you know, well, very strange looking landscapes, but they're landscapes nonetheless, or nightscapes that happen to have people in them sometimes, uh, as opposed to. I mean, not that they're the main subjects. I mean, the people are still the main subjects, but the landscape figures prominently into it. Uh, whereas if um, you're describing, uh, you know, uh, portraits with people, you know, just like half of them and then twinkly, twinkly lights in the background, it's not really a landscape shot anymore. Right. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Um, people, when they want to get engagement type portraits, I find want a traditional i have had people say uh i really want like we look small under the big milky way mm. sky you know and right. I, I, we already right. have the lenses to do that we can do that with the 15 to 30 the fish eye is never going to come into well i'm not going to say never but it, for my use case wouldn't come into play for that uh but this was one of those uh, traditionalist type lenses that i thought okay this is going to give somebody what they're used to when they're thinking engagement portraits, because I know typically what the average person is thinking in their head creatively. But also it's going to give me some astro opportunity like Edgar Town Lighthouse. Like that, yeah. 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 Yeah, and, and, yeah, the and that really does look great. So it does. I mentioned, thank you. I mentioned earlier that I like to use the Proto Machine to give you a little bit more of a uh, grassy boost on the color, and, and that's what uh, I yeah. did here. Okay. Um, Sometimes when you, then. yeah, there are, depending on the time of year, there's different stages of what the seagrass looks like near the beach. They go through the, that lush greenish look, and then they kind of fade out into the, they look like hay or straw, they get very <laughs> yellowy, you know? Yeah. And at this point in the season, they were starting to have that sort of muted greenish yellowish look. And I thought, eh, let's make it look a little bit more spring timey. Yeah. Mm. yeah did, sure. I, did you add the light to the to, to the right side of the lighthouse or was there some sort of uh, exterior light that was feeding into it? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So there there was actually a whole harbor over there and okay. so it's that's all kind of lighting. Pre -lit. Yeah, I didn't do any additional lighting on the lighthouse besides the uh, just the green-ish foreground. Okay. Um that, that's sort of the silver lining to the location, even though it was bright, it was, you know, it was enough foreground lighting. And if, if you look on the lower part of the, the tower on the left-hand side, you'll see a little bit of like a bright reflection down there. And there was a yacht yeah. playing very loud music. It seems like that yachts in that Edgar town Harbor year round, just partying all the time, any hour of the evening it's there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just utilized whatever lighting was around. Um, and from that particular angle too it made that nice sort of split you know you got your shadow and then you got the light yes um where in other areas there, there are a couple lighthouses on the cape that aren't lit at all they're lit from the top but they don't have any tower lighting and there's really nothing around it that that would light it. and then i would use the proto machine for that or some sort of light right um, right it works i want to also oh sorry 
No, uh, I also wanted to comment that um, it's remarkable how well the Milky Way comes out, considering how bright the landscape is. Or yes. the foreground. Yeah. Yeah, that um, that was a tricky one because at that I'll this bet. time of year in Edgartown, the Milky Way is moving closer to the harbor every evening, or you know, right after sunset, the Milky Way is already almost in that direction, like bumping up right against the light pollution. Um, I may try to get out there earlier in the season. Um, I'm doing an event out there in May, but I want to go out a little bit earlier than that too. So I can get a, a different alignment because earlier in the season, it is further away from that light pollution. But if, if I had gone out here in October, so a month later, uh, it would be right in it. As soon as the sun went down, it would be right there. So this is sort of my last opportunity, I think, seasonally to get it. At that point. And quite honestly, probably the last opportunity of that particular evening, because an hour later, and it would have been a little bit too close to it. So, yeah, th thanks. Uh, Astro Trace helped out quite a bit. You know, being able to do the longer exposure at the lower ISO helped. Mm -hmm. it, it does help to be able to pull that lighting down a little bit, pop up some contrast, reduce the shadows. Um, you can kind of work through it. I'll have to see if I can find the, I'll find the raw file and I'll throw it up on here too. So you can see the difference between the, what the original was and then what you have to kind of work through. Yeah. That'll be interesting. Uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah. Because it ended up being pretty, pretty absorbed. It was, I can't remember who it was who did a, a couple of years ago, they did like a Milky Way shot over LA or not far from LA or San Francisco. Out your way, Ken. Mm. Somewhere in that giant state of yours, <laughs> where there was a bunch, there was a bunch of light pollution, and they were able to pull a Milky Way out of that. And I was thinking about this when I was taking the shot. I'm like, oh, all right, we'll see what we get. I think I can I can work with it, and I did, I did. But you can see that the the lighthouse. I didn't really do any modifications on the top of the lighthouse. That in reality is a very deep red. It's a solar powered uh, beacon, um, and you can see it kind of looks a little bit faded. Right. And that's that's a function of the lens to some degree. I could have gone up there with a digital paintbrush and kind of fixed that a little bit. But I, I left it because I didn't want the red to be too overpowering on that. But yeah, Astro Trace, uh, just back to that real quick on uh, those longer focal length lenses seems to work really well. Most of the forums that I've seen, people seem to think 30, 30 to 80, somewhere in there. You know, not so great on the wide end, you know, not really useful on the super long end unless you're doing deep sky stuff. Um, I would say out of all the lenses that I have, this uh, 85 did the best overall with keeping the stars moving, even in the corners, keeping them nice and still as they, they moved and tracked. So Right, that's probably the optimal focal length then. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. if you're somebody Which, who wants to do Astro Trace and you're trying to find a lens that you can work with, maybe this might be a good starter one too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that probably also means that the uh, 28 to 105, if it's set somewhere around 85, probably does pretty well also, you know, as evidenced by one of the photos that you did. Oh, yeah. Um, I'll throw that up. The uh, the last the, shot the, of the evening. You're talking yeah. about the Orion uh, yeah. Yeah. one? So. Yeah. Yeah. The last shot of the evening at this uh, on this shoot was around three forty-five in the morning, and I had made it all the way to the other side of the island, and I was just starting to see that morning twilight. Like I couldn't see it with my own eyes. Yeah, you know, um, but the camera was starting to see it. Right. So I thought, well, I'm going to burn some time because I had a couple hours before the boat was going to come get me. I thought, let me just start pointing up. And I did that shot of Orion at, I think it was at a, I think it was at 105 mm. for two minutes or so. I'll throw that up here. And it did really well for just standing out in the middle of a field with almost no prep time and just pointing it up there. I think it worked out pretty well. 